What events led to the first battle of the Revolutionary War? When we fly the American flag on the 4th of July, it's important to remember that the road to independence was a long one for the colonists. They had worked hard to establish their lives in America and had grown increasingly frustrated with the taxes and laws imposed on them by the British government. Leaders from the 13 colonies decided to meet to discuss their options. So, in September of 1774, representatives from each of the colonies except Georgia met in Philadelphia. They expressed their outrage over the idea of being taxed without representation in Parliament and over new laws that limited their free speech and free trade. This meeting was known as the First Continental Congress. They voted to stop all trade with Britain until the Intolerable Acts, a series of punitive laws passed by Parliament after the Boston Tea Party, were repealed. As the First Continental Congress came to a close on October 26, 1774, members of the Congress made the decision to meet again in May of 1775 if the British Parliament refused to lift the Intolerable Acts. When Parliament heard about the colony's trade boycott, instead of repealing the Intolerable Acts, they passed more laws adding more limits on colonial trade. They also sent more British soldiers to the colonies. In response, the colonists formed militias, groups of armed men. Colonial towns also created bands of Minutemen to assist the militias. These were men who were ready to fight at a minute's notice. From the fall of 1774 until the spring of 1775, tensions continued to brew between the American colonists and the British. Informants and spies had alerted the British about the militias and their stockpiles of guns and gunpowder. The British decided to fight back by rounding up the colonial leaders of the resistance and seizing all of the guns and gunpowder they could find. They set their sights on the area near Boston but the colonists knew the British were coming. The colonists also had spies and men ready to ride their horses through the countryside warning of British raids. In April of 1775, British General Thomas Gage had received orders to seize the weapon stockpiles and to arrest the Patriot leaders thought to be hiding outside of Boston. General Gage hoped to avoid bloodshed and planned a surprise attack on Lexington for April 18th. Silversmith Paul Revere, along with Patriots William Dawes and Samuel Prescott, heard of the impending attack and sounded the alarm, riding to Lexington and Concord to alert local militias and persuade rebel leaders John Hancock and Samuel Adams to leave the city for their safety. By daybreak on April 19, 1775, 700 British soldiers had made their way to Lexington. They were met by a militia of about 77 militiamen. Shots were fired. To this day, no one knows who fired first. By the end of the battle, eight colonists were dead and 10 were wounded. The red-coated British soldiers marched on to Concord. As they crossed the North Bridge on the outside of town, they were confronted by a large group of militiamen guarding the bridge. The colonists fired shots. Although many men on both sides died during the battle, the colonists were able to defeat the Redcoats, who retreated back to Boston. At the time, neither the rebel colonists nor the British Redcoats recognized the significance of the battles of Lexington and Concord. But these skirmishes turned out to be the first battles of the American Revolution. Let's review what we have learned about the first battle of the Revolutionary War. Question 1. What did the colonists call the series of punitive laws passed after the Boston Tea Party? A. Townsend Acts B. Intolerable Acts C. Boston Port Act D. Currency Act the correct answer is B. The series of laws was known as the Intolerable Acts. Question two. Which of the following colonists rode through the Boston countryside warning of a British attack? A. Paul Revere. B. William Dawes. 
C, Samuel Prescott, D, all of the above. If you answered D, you know that all three men rode through the Boston countryside warning of a British attack. Question three, about how many British soldiers descended on Lexington and Concord on April 19th, 1775? A, 50, B, 100, C, 300, D, 700. The correct answer is D. About 700 British soldiers descended on Lexington and Concord. What was the Second Continental Congress? Once safely out of the Boston area, John Hancock and Samuel Adams traveled to the meeting of the Second Continental Congress. Remember, at the conclusion of the First Continental Congress, the group had agreed to meet again in May of 1775, if the situation with the British had not improved. Indeed, as the battles of Lexington and Concord proved, the situation had considerably worsened. Minutemen had been killed. Although people did not talk of war, the American Revolution had begun. Delegates to the Second Continental Congress had some important decisions to make. How should the colonies respond to the continued hostile acts of the British government? Members of Congress were divided. Some wanted independence at all costs, while others, despite resenting being taxed without representation in Parliament, wanted to avoid a war with Britain. In the end, the Second Continental Congress decided that a Continental Army should be established so that the colonies could protect themselves. George Washington was commissioned to be the Army's Commander-in-Chief. Supplies for the Army would need to be paid for, so the Congress authorized the printing of money. The Congress also named Benjamin Franklin as the Postmaster General and had formed a committee to handle relationships with foreign governments if the Congress needed help in the future. Still, some members of the Congress wanted peace. John Dickinson, a delegate from Pennsylvania, wrote the Olive Branch Petition, which made suggestions to King George about how to resolve the issues with the colonists. King George rejected the document, instead hiring German troops to help British soldiers bring the colonies under control. The Second Continental Congress remained in session throughout the Revolutionary War. Meanwhile, battles between British troops and the Minutemen continued. On June 16, 1775, colonial forces fought a hard two-day fight at Breed's Hill in Charlestown. Although the battle, which became known as the Battle of Bunker Hill, ended in victory for the British, it provided motivation and encouragement to the rebel cause. Battles raged between the two sides throughout 1775 and 1776. In January of 1776, Thomas Paine, an American writer and patriot, published Common Sense, a pamphlet which outlined his arguments in support of American independence and the creation of a democratic republic. The pamphlet was an instant bestseller. Many colonists thought that the idea of establishing a democratic republic was too radical, but Paine had people thinking, and support for the revolution continued to grow stronger. Let's review what we have learned about the Second Continental Congress. Question one, who was commissioned to be the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army? A, Benjamin Franklin. B, George Washington. C, John Dickinson. D, none of the above. If you answered B, you know that George Washington was the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. Question two, what was the name of the document sent by the Continental Congress to convince King George to resolve their conflicts peacefully? A. Olive Branch Petition B. Lasting Peace Proclamation C. Colonial Settlement Agreement D. American Peace Act The correct answer is A. The document was called the Olive Branch Petition. Question three. What was the name of Thomas Paine's best-selling pamphlet? A. Common Sense B. Arguments for Independence C. Reasons for War D. 
Thoughts for Freedom? The correct answer is A. Thomas Paine's pamphlet was called Common Sense. What were the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation? By early summer of 1776, fighting between the colonists and the British had gone on for more than a year. A majority of the members of the Continental Congress were in agreement that the time had come for the colonies to officially declare their independence from the British government. So, a five-man committee was established to write a Declaration of Independence. The committee then assigned the task of writing the document to Thomas Jefferson. After many revisions, the Second Continental Congress voted to adopt the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. In the document, Jefferson stated the colony's grievances against the British government, stated that they wanted their independence, and explained why. The preamble of the Declaration of Independence holds perhaps one of U.S. history's most famous quotes. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Copies of the document were sent to the colonies where it was read aloud in public and published in newspapers. A copy was also sent to King George. <laughs> Meanwhile, the fighting continued. As 1776 drew to a close, George Washington and his men scored a major surprise military victory after crossing the Delaware River and capturing German forces at Trenton, New Jersey on December 26th. However, 1777 was a tough year for the American fighters. The British were in control of Philadelphia and New York and began to attack the colonies in upstate New York. As the Continental Congress continued to meet, its members realized that they wanted to create some form of a central government that would unite the 13 colonies. The states also knew that establishing a government would allow foreign nations to officially recognize them and might lead these nations to aid in their cause. However, the states wanted to be clear. They wanted as much independence as possible and did not want a powerful federal government. A committee was established to write a document which explained how the Congress had been operating, what the purpose of the central government was, and what Congress could and could not do. This document was called the Articles of Confederation. It allowed Congress to conduct foreign affairs, make treaties, declare war, maintain an army and navy, coin money, and establish post offices. The Articles of Confederation stated that Congress was not allowed to elect a president of the central government or enforce laws. Congress could pass laws, but it could not force the states to obey those laws. The Articles of Confederation also prohibited Congress from raising money by collecting taxes. All Congress could do was request that states contribute money toward the war against the British and the running of the government. The document created a loose confederation of states with a weak central government. The Articles of Confederation is considered to be the first constitution of the United States. It was adopted by the Continental Congress on November 15, 1777. In order to become official, it needed to be ratified or approved by all of the states. That occurred on March 1, 1781 when Maryland became the last state to ratify the Articles of Confederation. Let's review. Question one. What member of the Continental Congress was primarily responsible for writing the Declaration of Independence? A, John Hancock. B, Samuel Adams. C, Thomas Jefferson. D, Benjamin Franklin. If you answered C, you know that Thomas Jefferson was primarily responsible for writing the Declaration of Independence. Question two, where did George Washington and his men win a surprise military victory on December 26, 1776? A, Boston, Massachusetts. B, Trenton, New Jersey. C, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. D, Oneida, New York. 
The correct answer is B. George Washington and his men won a surprise military victory in Trenton, New Jersey in December 1776. Question 3. What was the name of the Continental Congress's document which explains the purpose of the central government? A. The Rights of States B. The Tory Act C. American Manifesto D. The Articles of Confederation The correct answer is D. The Articles of Confederation explained the purpose of the central government. How did the Revolutionary War end? In the fall of 1777, the Continental Army and the British engaged in two battles of Saratoga. These two battles were fought 18 days apart on September 19th and October 7th. In the first battle, the British forces won a small victory as they tried to gain control of the Hudson River. However, the Continental Army won a bigger battle on October 7th when the British were forced to retreat. This was a major victory for the Americans, and the French government took notice. In early February 1778, the French government signed a treaty of alliance with the Americans. With this treaty, the French agreed to provide financial support, troops, and supplies to the colonists' war efforts. The American Revolution was now a global war. France's alliance with the Americans caused tensions to mount between the French and the British. On July 10th, France officially declared war against Britain. This was important because it caused Britain to divert attention and resources away from their fight with the colonists. Still, fighting continued between the Continental Army and British forces throughout 1779 and 1780. By June 1781, the colonists had chased British General Charles Cornwallis out of the Carolinas. His troops had been weakened, so Cornwallis and his army retreated towards Yorktown, Virginia to rest and await reinforcements. Cornwallis had also received orders to build a defensible deep water port in the area. While Cornwallis was retreating to Yorktown, American forces under the command of General Nathaniel Greene had recaptured all of North Carolina. So Cornwallis and his men could no longer go south. He couldn't go north or west either because 5,000 American forces under the command of Marquis de Lafayette were moving south from Maryland and Pennsylvania. Cornwallis figured that his only option was to escape out to sea, so he moved his troops to the forts he built at Yorktown. General George Washington and French General Rochambeau saw an opportunity. After making plans to attack Cornwallis with the help of a large fleet of French ships under the command of Admiral de Grasse, they began their march towards Yorktown on August 21st. By September 28th, American and French troops had encircled Yorktown. The British fleet that was to provide reinforcements had been forced to return to New York after being defeated by de Grasse's ships. Cornwallis was trapped and under siege. The battle at Yorktown lasted until October 19, 1781, when General Cornwallis surrendered. It was a decisive victory for the Continental Army, and it was the last major battle between British and American forces. Securing independence for the colonies, however, would take almost two more years. John Adams, John Jay, and Benjamin Franklin were sent by the Continental Congress to work on the terms of the peace treaty. Talks began in April 1782. The Americans were firm in their demands that any treaty ending the Revolutionary War include the colony's independence from Great Britain. It took time to work out all of the details, but finally, on September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed. For America, the treaty accomplished several major goals. It was the official end of the Revolutionary War. It gave independence to the 13 colonies to create their own state and national governments. It removed the British military from the American territories, allowed for the colonies to trade freely with whomever they chose, and established land boundaries that would later allow the United States to expand westward. 
The Treaty of Paris was ratified by Congress in early 1784. Finally, the former 13 colonies were officially recognized as the new United States of America. So, the next time you see the stars and stripes waving in the breeze, take a moment to think about the colonists' fight for independence. Let's review what we have learned about the end of the Revolutionary War. Question 1. Which country signed a treaty of alliance with America after the battles of Saratoga? A. France B. Spain C. Canada D. Mexico The correct answer is A. France signed a treaty of alliance with America. Question 2. Which battle was considered to be the last of the Revolutionary War? A. Battles of Saratoga B. Battle of Bunker Hill C. Battle of Yorktown D. Battle of Princeton The correct answer is C. The Battle of Yorktown is considered to be the last battle of the Revolutionary War. Question 3. In what year was the Treaty of Paris ratified by Congress? A. 1776 B. 1779 C. 1782 D. 1784 If you answered D, you know that the Treaty of Paris was ratified by Congress in 1784. Thinking Question Compare and contrast how people today share their thoughts and opinions about government with how the colonists did so.